Hi, everybody. It's my pleasure and privilege today to be speaking with correspondent Michael Yon. I reached out to Michael because I've been extremely interested in the European civil protests, specifically those centering in, at the moment, in the Netherlands, inspired in no small part by the Canadian truckers' convoy. Um, those, those protests are receiving short shrift and minimal coverage in what has become to known as the legacy media, which is more and more uh, in a collusional relationship, let's say, with the, with the globalist utopians who are attempting to guide our destiny so destructively and unsuccessfully. I reached out to Michael because I want to find out to the degree that I can what's going on, particularly in the Netherlands and more broadly in Europe and around the world. And uh, he's a cardinal person to talk to in this regard. And he's a very interesting person in his own right uh, for all sorts of reasons, which we'll get into as we progress. Michael was one of America's youngest Green Berets. That's not an easy thing to manage at 19 years old. He spent more than half his life overseas in more than 80 countries. So he's been everywhere, man, and has seen many things. Mr. Yon is also the author of three books published in the United States, including Moment of Truth in Iraq, 2016, and three others in Japan, covering, among other topics, the present and developing information war with China. He is America's most experienced combat correspondent, uh, not necessarily a title for the faint of heart, let's say. Most recently, as I said, and this is the proximal reason for this discussion, Michael has been tracking and covering the rising tide of civil disobedience in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Europe. So thank you, Michael, very much for coming in to talk to me today. I understand that you're in the Netherlands right now. You've been there for a couple of weeks. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what, why you're in the Netherlands and what you've been seeing and what you think it means. Yes, sir, Jordan. And, and thank you for inviting me on. I've watched your show for years now. It's, it's incredible to come on. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the Canadian uh, truckers. That, their courage cannot be and their inspiration cannot be understated. Uh, you know, courage is courageous, as is cowardice. And so we must display cur uh, courage. Uh, recently, some months ago, earlier this year, I drove from California to Washington, D.C. with American truckers who were inspired by Canadian truckers. And they were flying Canadian flags. All These are American truckers and Americans over bridges. I must have seen hundreds of thousands uh, flying uh, almost as many Canadian flags as Americans. You may have seen it uh, on the news while the news sort of blockaded it. No, no, we yeah. never see anything like that on the news in Canada That's because, uh, yeah, our, our media is so subsidized by the government that we, anything that runs against government dictates, and I hate to say that about a country like Canada, is just minimally or minimally covered or not covered at all. I had no idea that the, Can that the American truckers were flying Canadian flags. You'd think that'd be news in Canada because isn't it news when Canada becomes interesting and in fact, I know almost nothing about the truckers' convoy in the U.S. to Washington, um, and I do try to follow the news. Jordan, that, the, 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 the truckers' uh, a convoy in the United States from California to Washington, it was actually pretty massive, and I was there every step of the way. And so many Canadian flags, you wouldn't believe it, hanging off bridges, sides of the roads, even in blue states, uh, and, uh, and it was all uh, from inspiration from Canada. And so, uh, yeah, again, courage is courageous, cowardice is courageous, and uh, the um, Americans were, were very uh, proud uh, to follow the lead of, of Canadians. And so, again, this is spreading across the world. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Canadians don't even know it, do they? They don't even know it, because they don't no, want they the Canadian haven't. truckers to know it. No, no, they have no idea, and, and that's really sad, you know, that we're in a situation where we could have that be something that that we don't know. And so, well, that's part of what puts us in the situation that we're in. Okay, so you were with the American truckers when they went to Washington. What sort of effect do you think they had? Uh, it was galvanizing. Of course, you know, it's just one, one battle of many of, of awareness at that point. Uh, you know, the, and, and I, I spent so much time with the truckers because you, in every country that I go to, I want to know what the farmers think. I go straight to farmers. I want to know what people like truckers think, law enforcement, military, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the basic pulse of the, of the countries that I go to. And so, yeah, it, it, it had a good effect. It certainly, as you know, this is a long road. You've been talking about this for years. 
Uh, and it's you've been fighting this battle for years, and you know it's a knockdown, drag out fight, and it goes on. But you've mentioned I've watched some of your recent programs. You you acknowledge that we're actually making progress against the WEF and the other. Uh, they call them WEF here, the World Economic Forum, the WEF uh, in, in Netherlands. They call it WEF. We are making progress. Uh, you know, no no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy, and now we are the enemy for WEF, obviously. And, uh, and, and, and now that millions of people are waking up, it seems like by the week at this point, uh, you know, WEF is suddenly in for an actual real fight. And so that's why I came, I was just in Mexico, uh, tracking migrants as I've been doing. This is all part of a, a larger, uh, uh, a jungle, let's say. It's not just about farmers. It's not just about truckers. It's not just about the information. The information war obviously is PhD level warfare. All of the, the substrate for everything going on is information war, as you know. So who do you, th- okay, so you said we are the enemy, let's say. And so who do you mean by we? And what do you, what do you think the fight's about? How would you characterize it? And who do you think, so to speak, is on the other side? You mentioned the WEF and of course, they're, they're enemies of the moment, or what would you call it, villains of the moment, and I think deservedly so in many ways. So, But how do you characterize this battle? Why do you think it, of it as a battle? And uh, what does it look like from your perspective when you're talking to the truckers and the farmers and the, and the law enforcement types? Well, actually, it's, it's intergenerational, as you know. We could go back to the 1920s and talk about Russian information war and even Earlier, 1879, Grant was talking about it when he was in Paris. And so, uh, but so, so this isn't something that started last week or even last generation. Uh, but some of our, our, our biggest opponents at this point are certainly WEF and, and CCP, of course. I've written three mm-hmm. books on CCP information war. Unfortunately, they're that's only the in Chinese, Japanese language. That's the Chinese Communist Party for those of you who aren't up on the acronyms and uh, it, we'd be hard pressed to find a more devious enemy than the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, if you're a supporter of the CCP and its machinations, then you're either woefully ignorant to a degree that's almost incomprehensible or malevolent to the core or some appalling combination of both. So, And it's so strange to hear you talk about the CCP and the WEF in the same breath because you wouldn't think at all that those would be natural allies given that the WEF hypothetically is well, on the side of the planet and the West and civilization and the CCP are nothing but tyrannical, warmongering North Korean wannabes. So they're not, Jordan, I mean, that's an important point. They're not necessarily on the same side, uh, but they're part of the same jungle. I mean, these are two serious uh, opponents. Uh, you know, there's nobody that actually runs the jungle per se, right? And one of the massive opponents, obviously, is, is Chinese Communist Party. And they are excellent. They are masters at information war. Again, I've written three books on this that are only in Japanese language. I wrote them in English, but I was asked to publish books uh, uh, by a Japanese publisher in Japan about this, and so, and, and which I did, and in an attempt to wake up Japanese to the intense information war that they are undergoing. You know, I got kicked out of Hong Kong in 2020 uh, by the, obviously, the Chinese Communist Party because I was covering the fighting there for seven months and getting my share of rubber bullets and tear gas uh, constantly. Those things do sting, but they're not quite like bullets. Uh, the, uh, but the bottom line is, is the Chinese Communist Party, their information ground game is so intense. For instance, I went to Nanjing to look at the the, uh, the, the, the Rape of Nanjing Museum. This museum is, I, I've studied museum warfare in numerous countries, for instance, Indonesia, Malaysia, long list. And I'll often go to museums to look for uh, hints of, uh, of, of behind the scenes influence. And you see in the, in the, the, the Rape of Nanjing Museum in Nanjing, uh, China, that thing must have cost $50 million. I don't know how much it cost, but, but to be directionally accurate, Let's just assign a number, $50 million. And, uh, you know, when, when, when you show up there in the morning, there's dozens of buses filled with school children, and they, they go in their different color shirts for the different buses and the different flags, you know, so that, and I was the only uh, a foreigner there to my knowledge. And, you know, when you're about halfway through the museum, you're like, wow, that was the biggest museum. That's like the Louvre almost, you know, well, it's not quite that big, but, but it was quite a large museum. And, uh, but then you're only, you realize you're only halfway through it. Now, as a, as a, a mental health expert, you know that there's two components to hatred, and those are anger and disgust. That's like H2O. If you can, def- if you can combine anger and disgust, you will get hatred every single time. As you go through that 
I'm a writer, so I study these things as well. As you go through the Nanjing Museum, it's all about hatred and disgust focused towards Japanese, right? And it's clear, you know, if you want to know what a country's future plans are, you watch their information ground game. And the information ground game against Japan is a pure hatred. Uh, For instance, they uh, ring the sirens uh, several times a year in Nanjing, you know, as if there's an air raid going on. Uh, When you're, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in China all over the place. Uh, You know, at nighttime, if you're in the hotel room, you'll always see the movies. Here comes the drunken Japanese soldier again with his uniform, and he kills the, you know, the, the Chinese parents and rapes the girl, and he staggers out drunk. You know, there's that movie. And then next comes the second movie that night, same thing. It's the same story every single night, seven days I a don't, week. I don't suppose they show drunken cultural revolution students from the 1960s, like, killing people and, and, and destroying the, all the last vestiges of Chinese traditional culture. No, sir. Uh, no, that's obviously I imagine not, there. not. And you can see, for instance, in Okinawa now, one of, one of the things that, I mean, you've talked about these things before. Uh, you know, I have an office in Thailand. They're trying to split Thailand into three different parts. One of the, I, was, I was out with the Maoists in Nepal for about a year. One of the things that they did to help, uh, you know, the Maoists eventually win, if you want to call it winning, is to get everybody to speak their own languages, right? Everybody to go with their own uh, divide and conquer. When I was recently in Morocco, same thing. You see a new Berber language written on the road signs, which is like a, a new made-up language. I mean, Berber's not... Uh, not a made-up language, but the, the written component is. And I see these things all over the place. Where, you know, divided, it, it's been happening down in Colombia. I was down in Colombia last year with a senator, Maria Cabal, and Maria said, why are they trying to get all the indigenous people to speak their own languages and to fight each other and to fight us? And, of course, you know, Colombia just fell as well, right? So this is the same thing that they're doing in Panama. I've spent a lot of time in Panama recently, uh, and, and, and I'm watching that closely. You see Panama is melting down right now. And, uh, and you know, it, obviously there's a Panama Canal there that's of some significance, to put it mildly. Also, Panama is a major invasion route to the United States. I've spent many months that I took two congressmen there last year into the Darien Gap, one of the most dangerous jungles in the world. Actually, I can't believe they went out there. Uh, but they, they went deep into the Darien Gap, and I showed them exactly this invasion that's coming through uh, Asia and Africa and South America, up through Colombia, up through Panama, and going straight to the United States, right? Uh, people from about 140 countries, completely unvetted, uh, and, it, and it's growing. It's becoming massive. I was there when Mayorkas landed right in front of me in his Black Hawk helicopters some months ago, uh, e- expanding our program there for this invasion route. So all of these things fit together, Jordan. As you know, the information how do you, war... How do you stop from becoming paranoid? And, I mean, you're behind the scenes looking at all these strange things, this web of intrigue on multiple fronts. Um, how do you protect yourself against paranoia and conspiratorial thinking? And I, this is a very dead serious question because, it's, you know, it's very hard not to take on the trappings of your surroundings. And when you're constantly looking at intrigue and malevolence behind the scenes... I can't see how that could help but color your entire worldview. And so given that, why do you think people should trust your perspective and believe and believe that what you're seeing is veridical and and not like tilted by your own, what would you call it, preoccupations and situational peculiarities? Uh, well, <laughs> that's an excellent question. And I've asked myself that many times because self-auditing is essential in this line of work. And I do think I've had a sort of self-vaccination when I was younger on this particular topic because I, since I was a child, I was always into science, especially physics. And uh, I was just um, basically I was failing school because all I wanted to do was study physics. And so, and uh, you, you you can never waste a moment of your time studying mathematics and that sort of thing, right? And so. Uh, uh, you know, when you, when you start off when you're nine or 10 years old, basically enthralled by the sciences and you live in a fact, you built a fact-based world around your, your life, you, you, you build self-auditing into your thinking processes, right? Mm-hmm. You're always questioning whether, am I, is this just a perception? Am I right or wrong on this sort of thing? Uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, obviously I'm always, uh, uh, so, part of it's, so part of it's scientific rationality. Do you have people around you, friends and family, that also help keep you in check? 
Well, I've never really been highly conspiratorial to begin with. I mean, for instance, mm-hmm. when I, on the museum warfare, uh, you know, I, I mean, that was brought up to me by someone, actually, um, a military officer, that, a former now that I work with closely, uh, and, uh, and he, he, he flew over to Thailand to brief me on it maybe eight years ago or something, and uh, we, we, it briefed me on it quite a while, and then we started flying around to different countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and looking at these museums, and I said, wow, this is clearly cookie-cutter museums. It's clearly mm-hmm. designed to cause hatred against Japanese. And, you know, when we look at, oh, mm-hmm. good Lord, I could go on for literally days. I've written three books about it, so I'll have to self-edit there, But so I, mean, I could go on forever. But there is clearly a larger organization around these a muse- this museum warfare, and it's definitely centered in China. For instance, when I was at, at Penang, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, the, the curator of the museum. I said, wow, what a nice museum you've got here. Of course, it was all about hating Japanese. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and he said, oh, I just got back from, uh, I just got back from Beijing. And he said, I was invited there because they, they enjoyed my museum so much. And I said, oh, really? Do you have any photos? And he pulls out this book from under the desk. Actually, it's a large book. I photographed the whole book. And it's got photos of all the curators from all these different museums, such as Holocaust Museum in Houston, Texas, right? And it's got all the names in there. I photographed everything, checked out every name in the book, right? It's clear, and, and it took a lot of research, but we can clearly see this is part of a very sophisticated organiz- uh, 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 information operation that is, that's just part of it. Okay, well, let's, let's, turn, let's turn to the WEF and let's turn to the global utopists and to what happened in Canada. The Canadian truckers here, they were pushing back against what they regarded as unwarranted government overreach and intrusion into their private lives on the COVID front fundamentally. And I was a supporter of the truckers right from day one. I believe like you do that truckers and farmers and the men, particularly the men and the women who work on those frontline occupations have a pragmatic wisdom that the intellectual types often don't. And I've also noted too that the intellectual socialist types really like the working class in principle, but they actually don't like the working class as such because they tend not to hold the same utopian intellectual views that the globalists do. And so we saw that in spades in Canada. And I've seen my government take a turn for the worse on multiple dimensions in Canada that's jaw-dropping in its continuity and depth. And it's clearly the case that Canadians haven't woken up to that yet, although perhaps they're starting to. And a huge part of that is this appalling and unconscionable media collusion. And so now we see something similar happening in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands. And we should let everyone know, and you have to listen to this. This is so important. You know, the Netherlands is the world's second biggest exporter of agricultural products. This little tiny postage stamp of a country that was scraped out of the ocean has managed to put itself together so that it can not only feed itself, but so that it's a major agricultural supplier worldwide. It's a phenomenal accomplishment. We should be so happy with the Dutch farmers that we can hardly stand ourselves. And instead, the courts in particular have mandated that the farmers be scuttled. And the government, their own government, has basically come out right out and said, well, because you guys pollute so much, um, we have to crack down on you, as well as reducing the speed limits of our cars, which is another appalling move. And we, we're, we're sorry, but a lot of you are going to have to go out of business. But, you know, that's to make an omelet, a few eggs have to be broken. And as the president of Greenpeace in the Netherlands said recently, well, we know we're not going to combat climate change, the climate change emergency, without inconveniencing a few people. And now there's, what, 40,000 truckers in the Netherlands who are up in arms, and I believe 100,000 people have protested in Spain, and this is spreading into Germany and into the fishermen in the Netherlands as well, who are also being pressured by these utopian types. And so how do you tie that into what happened in Canada and the U.S., and, and what do you think's going on? Well, it's all part of a, this larger uh, World Economic Forum attacks on us, of course. And and uh, by the way, I lived in Europe for six years. Ich spreche Deutsch. Ich habe in Deutschland vier Jahre gewohnt. I lived vier, four years in Germany. I lived two years in Poland. Uh, and I've been all over Europe, right? Uh, but mostly not recently. Uh, mostly I've been in Asia recently and, and other places. And so, uh, 
But yeah, it's clear that, for instance, uh, when I was recently in Mexico uh, following the, the, the migrants uh, just streaming across, in, in May alone, we had about 310,000 illegally crossed into the United States in one month. And so How when many? I saw that. 310,000. Three, uh, r- roughly 310,000 known uh, crossed yeah. just in May, right? And so, oh, yeah. uh, and, and I'm not sure what that number is this last month. I've tried, I don't know the number yet, but, uh, but the bottom line is it's, it's increasing at a, at a, uh, at a very high rate. And this human osmotic pressure, I call it hop, human osmotic pressure, the push and pull of migration is greatly fueled by one, information campaigns, which I've seen in Colombia, for instance, on CNN, encouraging people to go north. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, obviously, another thing that causes hop is, is war, famine, uh, pandemic, uh, and also the economic uh, negative pressure, which would draw you into another place, right? So there's the mm-hmm. positive pressure that pushes you out and the negative pressure that pushes you in, pulls you in. And this is really uh, dramatically expanding. You can see this all, uh, also in, in Europe. As you know, big, uh, uh, they're being overwhelmed with Hungry mouths, actually, as we go into a global famine, which I've been warning about. Yeah, okay, so, okay, so let's talk about, okay, let's talk about this global famine, man, because I I see that coming in, in the fall in a big way. And so my sense is, well, partly because of the Ukraine conflict and the fact that we're wiping out a big chunk of the world's wheat supply and fertilizer supply, that we're going to be putting about 150 million people under intense food pressure, really starting this fall. I think that's when it's going to kick in. And my sense is, well, there's no way that can happen without mass migration pressure on Europe, maybe of a scale that makes the last migration crisis look like virtually nothing. And so am I being paranoid about that? You seem to be thinking along the same lines. And you said you've seen this coming for about three years. Uh, I think you're understating it, actually. So what's going to happen in the fall? I started warning in January of 2020, actually, and I've warned every day since. And it's and I'm uh, at this point I warn about you know half a dozen times a day. Uh, so, pan okay. for war. Let's talk about pan for war first. Pandemic, famine, war. The triangle of death. They always go together. If you get a big war or a big uh, pandemic or a big famine, you'll get the other two. You get one, you get the other two. It's three musketeers. And all of these things, any one of them creates the hop, human osmotic pressure, right? So these things yeah. go together. So when I saw this, I was one of the very first alerting on the pandemic, right? I was in January, in mid to uh, some, somewhere around January 19th, I think, I started warning about uh, uh, of, of uh, pandemic. And, uh, and, and, and so immediately, having studied war for so many years, not just kinetic war and the shootouts and all that, I did that for years, back when I was quite skinny and running around out in the wars and all that, uh, it, but th- there's also information war, which the PhD level of warfare. And then there's these, these other components that people must study if they're going to be a serious student of war, which is migration, pandemic, yep. and famine. They always go together, period. Yeah. Right? Okay, so, so let me ask you, let me ask you a question about that. So my sense was that on the pandemic front, that because we disrupted the supply chains, and we, we have by no means fixed that in the least, there's a shortage. You can't get a car in Canada. You can't get a motorbike. You can't get a, a personal watercraft. You can't get paper and cardboard for books. There's a there's a massive backlog and lineup for everything. I know that one container ship in five is now snared at a port. And so I know what happens when you put pressure on the supply chain. The people who suffer for that the most are the people at the bottom of the economic hierarchy. And so those are going to be people that are barely hanging on in developing countries, especially in North Africa. That would be my guess where this is going to affect, this is going to have the biggest effects. And so, you know, if you show a 1% increase in unemployment, you get a 5% increase in psychiatric hospitalization. And that's because there's a lot of people who are just barely making ends meet. And then if you double the cost of necessities like energy or let's say fertilizer, or we could even put in food, uh, then you're going to produce a, a tremendous amount of economic pressure on these people. Uh, tilt them into starvation. And so and we've seen what's happened in Sri Lanka, which is just an absolute bloody, major, significant, ongoing catastrophe. 21 million people in Sri Lanka. There's no way we're going to be able to feed them in any real sense for any long period of time. So uh, all that eco 
movement forward on the Sri Lankan front is going to ensure that those poor starving people are going to eat every goddamn animal on that in that entire country to stave off starvation. And then they're going to burn everything for fuel because what the hell else are they going to do? So this idea that we can make people poor, hungry, cold or hot by scaling back food production and disrupting energy supplies and that's somehow going to save the planet is as backwards a conception as any dimwit could possibly formulate. And so, okay, so what do you think is going to happen in the fall? Massive famines. And, you know, I, I went to Sri Lanka mm, four or five, six years ago to have a look-see. I'm often just going and looking and checking the police and the food supply. And, the, and there was plenty of food. Sri Lanka had so much yeah. food. I, it was just like and cheap and plentiful, right? And then the next thing you know, uh, here we go. Now, famine. Yeah, it was doing well. Yeah, one thing about famine. Famine creates famine in the same way that war creates war and fire creates fire. Famine creates famine. So when we go into these initial phases of famine, you'll see immediately, obviously, price controls will start to be enforced. This happens every time. It's happening right now in Panama in the last 48 hours, right? Price controls on gasoline and some other things. Oh, yeah. Okay. A lot of violence now in Panama. In fact, just minutes before you and I came on, I was talking with a friend in Panama about the current situation. That's how close I keep tabs on Panama. Uh, and, uh, for various reasons, one is the Panama Canal, and so, um, and so, and, and, and another thing is, is for instance, uh, uh, when when people are hungry, the, as you know, within 48 hours they're going to hit the streets, right? Uh, and they'll start robbing the stores, they'll start robbing the the trucks and the trains and the boats, and so then supplies stop going. Governments always start taking food from the farmers. They, without exception, mm -hmm. in my. Uh, 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 study over the years, the, the governments always go for the farmers, and, and like in Egypt, recently forcing the Egyptian farmers to sell to only approved, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, warehouses, that sort of thing. So people start robbing from the farmers as well, right? And then the yeah. farmers say, "Hey, I'm not making. I'm I'm either bankrupt or I'm not making any money." And so the farmers stop farming. So that's how you see we get into the second season of this, right? And so the, the famine creates more famine, just like fire creates fire. And then famine, uh, you know, let's say you have uh, 20 million people that are hungry in Sri Lanka, and as their nutritional uh, you know, resources diminish, so too does their physical resilience. And now they're open to disease. Many of the people that die in famines actually die from things like they call them famine fevers. One of those is typhus. Another is relapsing fevers. Uh, uh, cholera, which is not a famine fever. Waterborne, of course. Fecal. Anyway, the bottom line is m many of the people, if not most, who die during famines are actually from disease. And then this causes that human osmotic pressure, and these sorts of things often lead to more war, right? So it's a, it's a recursive sort of, you know, the, the, the factors just keep, uh, you know, it's, a, it's almost a, a, a fission reaction, right? And it, Pause, it yeah, sure, absolutely. And it's out of control, Positive feedback right? loop. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Runaway, Pareto distribution problem. Runaway, runaway catastrophe. Yeah, I get it. Positive feedback loops emerging everywhere. And why do you think, what are the factors that are driving the reemergence of the famine? Um, you said there's a lot of instability in Central America, and so we're going to keep an eye out there. Obviously, Sri Lanka has collapsed entirely, and there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that a major part of the reason that Sri Lanka collapsed is because the globalist utopians get, gathered the reins of government in Sri Lanka, because it was actually developing at quite a rate, and as you said, it would have had a lot of food and not a bad general income level just a few years ago. So this wasn't a catastrophic country to begin with. It was a country on the move upward, and it was completely scuttled by these globalist plans. And so what's contributing to the developing famine right now in, and where do you think it's going to be most intense? Where will it be the most intense? That's a, something I think about every single day. Uh, one of the things I've learned in wars and in the study of war is uh, whatever you think will probably turn out to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know this. I watch so many of your programs. Uh, the, 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 this, you know, the the the, uh, uh, the the systems that uh, that emerge will will present themselves in due course, right? Uh, what we can see is the the my, you know when I talk with uh, Laura Logan, the famous uh, correspondent, she'll say. They've been talking about, you know, uh, 1.2 bill, they meaning World Economic Forum, have been talking about, uh, 1.2 billion people, uh, 
uh, forced to migrate. They've been talking about that for years, and it's true. Yeah, and they're going to uh, blame it. They're bloody well going to blame it on climate change. You watch. That's absolutely. what they're going to do. You absolutely. bet. You bet. Yeah. So 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion. So my estimate, estimation of 150 million, as you think, is optimistic. I think highly optimistic. I, I would not Jesus. be surprised. Uh, uh, Jordan, I would not be surprised if within, by 2025, if a billion people aren't dead. I mean, we're really heading into the most epic famines that have ever happened in human history. Yeah, I you know, this seven look, days man, I, I was I was looking at a I was looking at a Economist cover the other day, the Econ- Economist magazine, and it said twenty million p- people saved by COVID vaccine. And I thought, yeah, you bastards! For every mil- for every million persons that you saved with the lockdowns and the whole vaccination, sc- uh, uh, not the vaccination scam, but the but the pandemic panic, you're probably going to kill 50 because of supply, dis- supply chain disruptions and postponed starvation. And so, you know, that's part of the problem with turning political decisions over to the medical experts is that, well, we save, we save some people with the left hand and we doom 100 more with the right hand. And, 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 that, and there, there is a lag. We, tr- we basically tried to shut down the world's economy for two years as if we could do that because, well, look, everything's so plentiful, isn't it? Doesn't it? matter at all that people aren't going to go to work. It turns out that it actually matters a lot. And so what are the factors right now that are contributing to this emergent food insecurity, quote, problem? Why are, why are these people who were being fed not being fed now? Let's talk about energy. Energy is another kill shot, yeah. right? Yeah, and you yeah, see oh, right. uh, this highly ill-advised war in uh, Ukraine Uh, You know, I was in Lithuania last year warning about this over and over and over. I was down in Morocco uh, with my friend, war correspondent Chuck Holton, and we called up uh, Frontex, which is like the European border patrol, you might say. They're they're headquarters in Warsaw. And they said, Belarus, Lukashenko, the dictator there, is pushing migrants into Lithuania. And I had been with the Lithuanian army in Afghanistan. I called them up. I said, what's going on? And they said, hey, come on up. So I flew from Morocco to Vilnius, Lithuania, and I had full access to their uh, elected officials, intelligence, uh, the camps for the migrants and, and army, the whole thing. So for almost a month, right? So I was very well aware that Russia is up to something. Uh, and I was publishing that, right? And so we, we've gone into this war on Ukraine, right? And uh, Russia is just, of course, obviously, uh, Nord Stream is cut. Will it be turned yeah. back on? And now, as you probably are aware, we just had an I explosion. wouldn't turn it on if I was Putin. I wouldn't either. And, no, you know, no. even Trump warned them about this years ago, love him or yeah. hate him. Uh, he was very clear about it. And yeah. we just had an explosion roughly a month ago at a Texas port, an LNG facility, which is critical, right? We were supplying uh, liquid nat- uh, natural gas to Europe. This would have helped. You need this for the Bosch, the Haber-Bosch uh, process to create the, many of the fertilizers, right? That natural gas is very important. Then we had an explosion and uh, a, 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 a pipeline explosion roughly two weeks ago in Texas. And then we Jesus. just had another uh, uh, natural gas uh, uh, problem at a, at a plant in Oklahoma. We've had three, Oklahoma, How? two in Texas, right? Meanwhile... They're being shut off in from Russia. And we've got a potential war brewing here, for instance, between Iran and Israel. Imagine where that could go on energy supplies. We're looking okay, at... Okay, so let's, know, let's, look at, let's look at that for a minute. So I'm going to lay down a proposition here for all of you who are listening. If you are a friend to the poor and the oppressed and the hungry, the number one thing you want to do is drive energy prices as low as they possibly can be on every front that you possibly can manage. And that bloody well includes coal and petroleum and natural gas. And then we could add nuclear to that. And if you want to throw renewables in for the tiny percentage that they account for, you could do that too. But because energy is equivalent to work and because 
Work is equivalent to food and shelter. If you make energy expensive, what you do is you starve the poor. And you don't have to starve them very much before they become desperate and things fall apart. And then we fall into these positive feedback loops that Michael has been describing. And so when you hear these bloody globalist, globalist utopians talk about the necessity for higher energy costs, you remember that that co comes directly at the cost of the world's poor. Christia Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, two weeks ago had the unmitigated and I would say quasi-demonic gall to announce publicly that $8 a gallon gasoline in Canada was actually probably a good thing because Canadians should be reminded nonstop just how severe the climate crisis is every time they fill up their cars. And that's perfectly bloody fine unless you're living on the edge of your economic capability. And the fact that you can't afford to fill up your car anymore puts you into unemployment and food deprivation in relationship to your children. And that's in the rich West. And now in Europe, we're so goddamn stupid on our energy policy because of these idiot environmental schemes that we've made ourselves pathologically reliant on the Russians. And we're going to bloody well see what that costs us. And I know the Germans are burning coal again because their, their switch, massively expensive and counterproductive switch to so-called renewals has been another catastrophe. And so now God only knows how expensive energy is going to be become. And that's directly related to the provision of the famines that Michael is talking about. So get ready for this, folks, because it's coming down the pipes. Jordan, uh, Germans are collecting wood right now uh, as much as they can get. They realize this can be a very cold winter, right? Yeah, this is uh, going to be a very... Well, that's what I thought. The globalist utopian mantra, let the poor freeze in the dark. That's how you save oh, yeah. the planet. It's yeah, no kidding, that, man. Uh, if anything it can destroy the, the European Union, that'll be it. If Germany collapses, it's over, right? And, you know, many of us have been looking at Greece and uh, Italy and Portugal and Spain for years, wondering which one would go first. I thought it would probably be Greece, but we saw Italy looks like they might be the first to fall off the tree, right? And, uh, and, 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 and probably the other three, Italy, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, you know, Greece or Italy already, uh, you know, Greece uh, probably will be soon to follow. These are the weak uh, canaries in this coal mine. I mean, it'll fall but out of the European Union. Oh, yeah. And now, look, uh, uh, Putin has just uh, cut the gas uh, for the annual maintenance. And, uh, and of course, yeah. we've got uh, Zelensky over there uh, saying that, you know, Canada should not send back the turbine to Germany. And, you know, like, he's inserting himself basically into the life and death of hundreds of millions of people. Zelensky, the actor. Uh, you know, I mean, this is really, we've never seen something like that. I mean, I, if, if things continue, it's all about conditions. People often talk about sparks. You know, what will be the spark? spark yeah, yeah, sparks, no kidding, man. Sparks, sparks is an amateur question. Professionals talk about conditions. There's always yep. sparks. And the conditions that are being set now, with whether it be the inputs of fertilizer, uh, yep. fungicides, pesticides, all the other uh, chemicals that go into agriculture, the energy, diesel, uh, LNG, uh, just so many factors that, uh, that are really going the wrong direction transport. You know, famines in the past have generally been, uh, recently I found the 1910, 1911 Britannica, uh, and I looked up famine. I was just seeing what they, you know, uh, thought about famine back then. And, and it was a very wisely written uh, 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 entry in the Britannica, and they said they, they and the entry uh, posited that, 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 you know, large famines are probably a thing of the past because now we have modern transportation. Obviously, some of the largest famines were yet to come because the largest famines are always caused not by locusts and drought. They're caused by people taking yep. advantage of these things, right? Like the, like the, the Holodomor in, in, uh, 1932-33 yep. in Ukraine. Very good book on that called Red Famine. Where six million people were starved to death by the communists and where, where women were shot if they went out into the fields that had already been harvested to glean individual kernels of grain by hand to feed their children. If they didn't turn over those individual kernels of grain, then they were, then they were summarily executed. And that was fun in the communist Soviet Union. Only six million Ukrainians. And so, and, and you're exactly right on the famine front, as we like to think that the reason that people starve is because we don't have enough food. And at the moment, the reason that people starve is because we're stupid and often malevolent. And so, okay, so Germany's in trouble. And... A huge part of this, as far as I'm concerned, is because of these unbelievably ill-advised energy policies that were hypothetically put in place to aid, uh, aid the planet's movement towards lower climate uh, transformation. And 
fair enough, you know, maybe we have some concern on that front, but this, this absurd panicking combined with post hoc central planning and this insane notion that we can, ins- we can somehow make energy more expensive without producing uh, cascading sequences of catastrophes is naive beyond belief and malevolent, at least in part. So now Germany's in trouble because they're hyper-reliant on the Russians. And so now back to the Dutch farmers. Now the, the, the Dutch government put pressure on the farmers recently because a, legislat- a legislative body that was EU controlled, that's my understanding, decided in favor of an idiot environmental group that, that, that com- and the court compelled the government, so that's a non-legislative body, by the way, the court compelled the government to act in relation to the farmers. And apparently the farmers have had enough of this. And so what's happening in Holland and, and elsewhere in Europe on the revolutionary front, let's say, and, and, and what do you think their motives are and what effect has this had in Holland? Wow, this is a big topic. As you God, know, the yes. Dutch farmers are probably the finest and most efficient in the world, right? And uh, practically no Dutch people seem to know that, which is extraordinary, right? And, and, uh, and, and they don't realize how important their farmers are to the world with, as the second largest food exporter in the world. Yeah, it's, well, it's a miracle, right? Because how big is Holland? It's like, it's a tiny country. You can drive across it in like three hours. Meanwhile, Mark Rutte, the prime minister, is the teacher's pet of Klaus Schwab. I mean, he's yeah. even more favorited than Trudeau, right? Which is pretty hard to do. And so... That's right. That's a hard contest to win on, on the appalling front. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, the bureaucrats in Brussels, they are ruling by decree, right? And of yeah. course, it yeah. has nothing to do with nitrogen. Here they're talking about nitrogen. It has nothing to do with nitrogen. It has nothing to do with ammonium. It has to do with m- numerous things. One is taking the land, just as uh, happened with Stalin in Ukraine, you know, with the, uh, labeling the farmers kulaks in Ukraine, you know, the Ukrainian farmers, and, and uh, attacking and killing them. Here in Netherlands, there is an information campaign to make the farmers look like bad guys here as well. I mean, these are the new yeah. kulaks, right? When Meanwhile, let me tell you something about farmers. I have spent more than half of my life overseas, more than 80 countries, a lot of war. I'm always going out with farmers, right? And yeah, I've never yeah. met farmers from any country I can't get along with. I mean, uh, there, and, 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 like even Taliban farmers had common sense. At one point, I'm in Afghanistan out with uh, one guy. He's growing opium. And he's growing poppy for opium. And uh, he said, you know, he's showing me the bugs on his plant. He said, your helicopters drop these bugs on our plants at night to kill our plants. And I said, well, no, sir, we should be doing that because you're creating opium. But, but we don't. We're not that smart. And he goes, ha, ha, ha. yes, you're not that smart. And then like, let's go have tea. And, but anyway, even at one point I'm out with the, because I, the two years I spent in Afghanistan, one year was, was with various militaries like British and, and American militaries and, and, and uh, Lithuanians and that sort of thing. And another year was just alone, running around out with farmers and whatnot. And at one point- Yeah, well, know, the farmers, with, farmers are so much, they're like truckers in that regard. They're so much in contact with, with the- they have Yeah, they're like- con. Yeah, yeah, electricians and contractors and carpenters. That's why Christ was a carpenter, by the way, because if you're not honest, you can't build a house that stands up, man. And he wasn't a PhD sociologist. He was a carpenter. And those people who have to have their hands in the dirt and their feet on the ground, they have a sense about how the world works that's practical and embodied that the, the pinheaded academic globalists lack entirely and are also often incredibly jealous of. And so in Canada, it was the farmers and the truckers who rose up, you know, the misogynists and the bigots and the racists in our prime minister's terms. And then that's triggered these, these co-occurring protests in in the u.s and in holland and now it isn't easy to get farmers upset either eh? because those tractors that they bring to the protests those things are bloody expensive and most of the farmers don't own them they're they have to finance them and so they're running on very thin margins three to five percent a year generally and you have to be one canny person to run a big farm in a modern economy you have to be paying attention to all sorts of unbelievably complicated and sophisticated things. And so when the farmers have been pushed to the point where they're willing to take time away from their farms to spray manure on the government steps, it's probably time to listen. So I agree with you on that front 100%. So, okay, so you're in Holland and you're talking to the farmers and what are they telling you? Well, you basically are reading my mind, which is very difficult to do. <laughs> when, so when I was just in Mexico, uh, you know, and I saw the Dutch farmers, I, I know a lot of people in Netherlands, 
And so when I was getting inside, you know, that they were acting up, I was like, well, Dutch farmers are actually protesting? No, yeah, right, 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 man. The last people you'd ever expect. <laughs> we, yeah, so that's why I jumped on the airplane. Uh, because, you know, if, if the Dutch farmers are acting up, I need to come over here and hear what they have to say. That's and, for sure, uh, so, man. So let's talk about that. It's, it's, it, first of all, clearly the, the, the WEF, the WEF, they call it WEF here in the Netherlands, the World Economic Forum, is trying to control food supply, right? That is production and distribution, right? And so, uh, and one of the ways to do this is, as Stalin did with, and Mao did in China, and Stalin did in Ukraine and, and Russia, is to take the farms away from the traditional farmers and then put your, new, your farmers on that land, right? To what end, Michael? Like, I read about, you know, the, no, the, the notion that we need that we need to, you know, turn to plant-based foods and insect-based protein in the future and that, you know, meat production and all the cow methane are contributing to the degradation of the environment. But, like, what, what, what do, you, do you see this as a plan or just as a, as a part of the globalist utopian ideologically blind stupidity? Because, I mean, there are, farmers do pollute. There is runoff from, from fertilizer. It does cause algal blooms, for example, in the water. And these are, these are problems. I don't think they're insurmountable problems. But you're pointing to something that's more malevolent and deeper and programmatic. And, and you know, we don't want to go there without, without questioning that presumption. I always think if you can explain it with stupidity, you don't have to explain it with malevolence. Well, as you know, that's a be careful with that one because sometimes we do have to go to malevolence. In this I know, case. I know, we do, uh, yeah. And I, and, I, and I watch your show enough to know you know exactly why this is happening. And let's talk about this. If the Dutch farmers, let's take this as a premise, are the most efficient in the world, well, let's just say they're the second most efficient. Why would you knock them out of the saddle to get somebody else to produce the food? Where, Indian farmers? I mean, who's going to produce this food in a much less efficient way that would create even more pollution? This is clearly about control. Also, there's something that you never hear in, in, uh, in, in any press that, uh, uh, in, in, that I've heard in the United States is the tri-state city. Tri-state city is this smart city that they're proposing to build between the tri-states are Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany. So this mega city, basically, uh, that would take up all this farmland in that area and which would uh, bring uh, huge amounts of more people into this area, right? So the tri-state city is something you don't hear much about, but that's another part of this plan. There was a fire about maybe 10 days ago. I went to it right after the, the next morning, and it's, it's at a picnic distribution center, which is, uh, there was a, there was a, uh, an investment, $600 million into this picnic food distribution center from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, coincidentally, and it burned down, right? And so, you know, that brought a little, you know, raised some eyebrows. Why did that thing just burn down? There's many of them. I, there's others in Netherlands that are growing. But the bottom line is, is the Bill and Melinda, or Bill Gates, is buying up farmland, as you know, all over the place. I know. He is the biggest private landowner in the United States right now, and the land that he's buying up, he's taking out of food production. And it seems to be because he's obsessed about, about meat production, at, at least in part, doesn't believe that that's part of a sustainable future. And so, but, but I, I do share your, your skepticism. It's the same thing happens on the bloody energy front. It's like, well, Australia won't build coal, coal generating electrical plants, but they'll ship their bloody coal to China where they're going to build much dirtier plants. And the same thing applies to Canada. If we shut down our industry, energy industry, which our bloody, insane, narcissistic, delusional, traitorous prime minister thinks happens to think is a good idea and seems to be working as hard as he can to manage, all that's going to happen is that we're going to cede the ground to people like Putin, who we also turned into a radical enemy with his, with his hands on the control pump for Europe. I mean, I don't see how we could be stupider here in the West if we actually took courses in stupidity and tried as hard as we could. It's, it, we seem to be doing everything we can to break everything as rapidly as possible. And then I wonder, too, you know, is it has it got to the point where the people who think, you know, that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs and there's too many people on the planet think that this is some sort of. Like needles eye that we have to go through all this mass starvation and death so that we end up with a sustainable population. I mean, Jesus Christ, that's a dim and grim scenario. But I, as you said, why would you take the Dutch farmers out of business when, when they're so unbelievably hyperproductive and efficient? It's just, 
It's not like there's too much food, especially not if we don't have farmers. If anything, I would be uh, trying to get a, a large agricultural institute here in Netherlands to teach other farmers how to be as efficient as Dutch farmers are. Uh, we replicate these farmers. In Afghanistan, actually, many of the farmers coming over, I was out in the farms quite a lot, uh, were actually Dutch farmers uh, to teach Afghans how to do things better. Uh, but the bottom line is, as you can see, there is a huge, I watch you all the time, you know what's happening. There's a huge authoritarian uh, 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 the, the, the desire to have a one world order is clearly strong. And this isn't the first time it's happened. As you know, it's a constant in human behavior. And, and also, as, a, as, a, as somebody who studies the human psyche a lot, as you do, you realize pulling these farmers off of their traditional farms unroots them. It cuts their anchor, their boat anchor. They're going to be drifting, uh, you know, culturally. So that makes them much easier to, you can't control farmers well. That's why yeah, Stalin wanted yeah. to get rid of the farmers. You know, Stalin had to get rid of those farmers because farmers have a mind of their own. Same with Mao. You got to get rid of those farmers because they think for themselves. And likewise here, these Dutch farmers think for themselves. And so they're the bad guys. To me, they're the great guys. These are the yeah, me too, man. To defend. That's our yeah. backbone. They are our backbone. That's why I flew to Netherlands from Mexico. I mean, that's how important this is. Okay, so what have, you dis what have you discovered on the ground there? You've been talking to farmers. Tell us, first of all, tell us about how the protests were organized, what their scope is, and what the farmers, why the farmers are doing this and what they hope to accomplish. Well, the farmers, actually, the farmers in Netherlands are, are amazingly uh, cognizant of what's happening. Uh, many people that I talk with around the world don't realize, you know, these other things like the WEF, you know, WEF and these sorts of things. But the, the, the Dutch farmers are talking about it in detail. They're like, ah, the nitrogen is nonsense, you know, and it's all about Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates is trying to do this and they'll go into great detail. They know exactly mm -hmm. what's happening. They're trying to take our land because of this, this, and that, and the other. And, you know, they, they know it. They're not just like in Panama, it's another story. Panama is just like, give us cheap gas, give us cheap cheese, you know, keep, you know, cheap this and cheap that and we'll go home, right? They're easily satisfied. Not the Dutch farmers. They're more sophisticated. These are serious players here. And again, that's why I jumped on an airplane. If people like this are blocking streets around Netherlands and we got the German farmers joining up with them and saw, they're blocking the border together. German and Dutch farmers, right? Polish farmers. You know, I love Poland. I spent two years there. Polish, Polish farmers are, are making videos in support of Dutch farmers. That's how much is, look, that started in Canada, jumped over to the United States. It's over here now. I mean, it's really growing. This courage is, is spreading. And so, uh, and, and you see Italian farmers, Spanish farmers, people are rising up. And the more they realize what's actually happening, because, you know, the man behind the curtain is the, is the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Of course, we're going to have to deal with China. But at this rate, look, if Germany falls from these energy issues, which is looking pretty likely at this point, China is going to peel off the rock too, right? As are we economically, right? So, oh, uh, for sure. We'll, yeah, we we'll cannot to sustain. Together, we cannot. We cannot sustain the collapse of Germany. That's absolutely one hundred percent obvious. That would be an utter bloody catastrophe. If Germany collapses, EU is gone, right, for a while, right, and uh, and, and uh, I mean the EU will probably dissolve. That's my guess. I don't know. We'll see when time unfolds. But obviously, that'll take our economies with it, and China, right, and Japan, and of course, Japan imports what. 60, 70 percent. All these island nations and island state like Hawaii that import Hawaii, 90 percent of their food imported. Right. All yeah, these, yeah. They are going to be in for a world of hurt. Uh, Japan imports most of its food. And, you know, some of these countries that I, I have to, uh, I, you know, I, I, and I kind of uh, uh, I should say maybe insulted uh, the French for a while years ago and saying, why are they de de defending all these small farmers all the time? Now I see the French wisdom, you know, and these uh -huh. small farmers. Yeah, that resilience and these small, you know, when you go to France and you go to, I'm sure you've been to France. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and their small farmers everywhere provide a great deal of resilience, right? And that's why yeah. in Netherlands, if they, if they lose, these farmers are vital for that. They're as important as their army. I mean, uh, you know, without these farmers, you're somebody else's, uh, you're, you're in somebody else's pocket, Bill Gates, the World Economic Forum. 
Yeah, well, and also if you lose, if you lose the farmers for one generation, you learn, you lose all that knowledge. You know, and I, I saw the government said, well, some of these farmers are just going to have to move. It's like, what are they going to do? They're going to move their farm. How are you going to do that? You can't move a farm. And it's not like these things are just what transferable, fungible in this simplistic manner. And so, yeah, this is, gen- this is, it's such a form of insanity and it's all justified by the fact that these Half-wit globalists are claiming constantly to be moral because they're saving the planet. And, you know, I know this literature. I know the, lit- the planet-saving literature, let's say, because I studied it for about four years and in some depth. And I think I found the world's thinkers who thought this through properly. And that would be Matt Ridley and Bjorn Lomberg and Marion Tupi, most particularly. And all three of them, and I would put Bjorn Lomberg at the top of that uh, list, those thinkers knew something fundamental and something so bloody optimistic that I couldn't believe it was true when I first encountered it, which was that if we really want to reach a kind of sustainable harmony with the planet, the best way to do that, absolutely obviously, is to distribute autonomous free market systems as widely as possible, and then to get people everywhere in the world as rich as we can, as fast as we can. Because the biggest contributor to environmental degradation isn't industrial uh, it is, isn't industrial development. It isn't the efficiency of the Dutch farmers. It's absolute bloody poverty and privation and the probability that people at the bottom of the economic distribution are going to fall into these po- catastrophic positive feedback loops that you described and devastate and lay waste to everything. As soon as you make people rich, the data on this are crystal clear. As soon as you get people up to about $5,000 a year in gross domestic product, They start caring about the environment locally and autonomously. And so, you know, we're in a situation right now where if our leaders weren't so concerned with scoring cheap reputation points and being hyper moral in their ignorance and and pretentious in their global uh, ambitions, we could be working towards a world where everybody had enough food and enough education and were simultaneously inspired on their own account to to what engage in the kind of environmental stewardship that would leave a good planet for their children and their grandchildren. We could have our cake and eat it too, you know? And yet what we're doing is we're breaking the supply chains and dooming the poor and, and fostering what's going to be a mass migration into Europe. And that's just going to be a bloody catastrophe. And I, I hate to see this and, and I, I hope I'm wrong and I'm just being paranoid, but, but I don't think so. I don't think you're being paranoid. Uh, you know, I, again, I spend most of my time downrange. Uh, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time in places like China, India, just good Lord. I mean, you know, when, when you land in China, sometimes I wonder if my airplane's going to make it through the smog or we're going to get stuck like amber in the, in the smog. You know, I mean, it's so thick, sometimes you can't see the ground. It's unbelievable. And, and likewise with India, right? Uh, I spent almost a year in India and another year in Nepal, right? Uh, it's just it, in, in Thailand where I have an office, sometimes... You have to have air filters in every room and, uh, because, you know, because all of Asia's, not all of Asia, but most of Asia's burning their farmland every year. You can see it in satellite photo. Look it up. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, I mean, this pollution that comes from poverty is quite intense. Not that China is poor and rich and, and, and India obviously is, is, uh, increasingly wealthy, but they have huge amounts uh, of, of, of impoverished people and their factories still actually are behaving as if they're poor. They're dumping smog out, you know, unfiltered. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, and, and, and anyway, we could go on about that forever. Uh, but the bottom line is the farmers are clearly under attack here in Netherlands. The German farmers also were very efficient. Again, I lived fear, uh, sorry, four years in Germany. And, uh, and, uh, that, and, and, and their farmers are also under attack. And, and so all, all across Europe. How many people are engaging in these, in these protests right now? And, and are they raging as intensely now as they were a week or two weeks ago? Uh, my sense is that they're actually growing. Uh, they're, they're not, uh, they're not, say, going like Panama was in Santiago last night in Panama, very violent and burning things and stealing police cars. They're not doing that here. But you can see it's a more intellectual uh, at this point. It's not gotten intensely emotional at this point yet. Uh, although I, I anticipate when, if the energy doesn't get turned back on and, and, and yep. up through the Nord Stream, things are going to get emotional, right, uh, all across Europe, including here. Now, m- most of the Dutch that I talk with, 
I was talking with a, a member of parliament the other day. He was completely oblivious to the famines, right? Just like Jesus he, Christ. He missed, totally missing it, right? And so this, this is kind of of concern. And most of the Dutch people I speak with uh, actually don't seem to see that, uh, which is of good. But there's, these stores are, are nicely stocked and yeah, this is yeah. Netherlands. It's a place of yeah. honey. It's milk and honey here, you know? Yeah, and so it's yeah. kind of, as you know, you're a student of history. Uh, often it, before the storm, everything's quite nice and the wine is flowing. And that's the way it is right now. Yeah. And so I've read um, Western reports that it's about 40,000 um, Dutch farmers. And so I don't know what percentage of the farmers that is. And I don't know if those numbers are anything approximating accurate. And I don't know if you also are aware, no doubt you are, of what's happening in Spain, where I understand there's been about 100,000 people protesting. And so um, what's the scale of this in Holland? And it's growing into the, the fishermen are also coming out in support of the truckers, as far as I've been able to tell. And <laughs> if you want a job that's even more difficult than being a farmer, maybe being a fisherman would be the more difficult job. And so what sort of scale... What sort of scale are these protests uh, manifesting at the moment in Europe? And how many countries do you think are involved? You said Poland, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands. Um, scale and, and spread. Yep. Italy. Italy as well. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of reticent to make that guess yet. And I've actually okay. published about this many times over the years, whether I was in uh, the fighting in Thailand or the fighting in uh, in uh, Hong Kong, and I, which I've spent many years in these sorts of things, and I'm often you know, reticent to to uh, to assign numbers. Now, the media might say forty thousand or whatnot. I know it's a lot. Let's put it that way. And I and I do sense that it's growing. Uh, it's not gripped the nation yet. It's not r reached that level at all. You see that the Dutch flag is often being flown inverted now. Instead of red, white, and blue, it's blue, white, and red. And now the, 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 the Dutch government about uh, within the last week or so said that they're going to start you know, taking those off of the overpasses because they present some sort of danger. Of, oh, oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah, danger yeah. is people will take a photo and put it on uh, you know, their social media, right? And then it'll spread. Uh, and, and one town, I think two days ago, said that they're, that, you know, they're not going to do it. They're just going to let them fly, right? So, I mean, it, so the symbols are growing. Uh, I'll meet with well, one of the Dutch. Okay. Well, we want to we want to focus on something here, too, for the enlightenment of the listeners and viewers. So I don't know if there's a more intelligently and compassionately and justly civilized country in the world than the Netherlands. So let's think about that country. I mean, first of all, it shouldn't even exist. The Dutch had to literally drain the oceans and build walls just to make the country exist. And believe me, man, you bloody well better be organized in order to do that. And they did that hundreds of years ago and put together this unbelievable system of irrigation and drainage that ran on those amazing windmills, which are technological marvels. And, and Dutch society is unbelievably civil and peaceful and productive and interesting and culturally vibrant. It's a great country. It's a, it's a stellar miracle, as Ayan Herzi Ali uh, pointed out when she moved there from, from uh, Somalia. And so, so we don't want to underestimate the central significance of Holland and then obviously of the Netherlands. Obviously, that country is predicated to some degree for its success on the provision of stable food supplies and these unbelievably efficient farmers. And so the fact that they are up in arms about all this is of signal, symbolic, and practical importance, which is why I think it's so necessary to focus on their concerns and also so appalling that this isn't headline news in every, every legacy media outlet across the, across the West. Because when the Dutch farmers are upset and moving en masse the way they are, something has gone seriously wrong. This is a canary in the coal mine situation. It really is. And, you know, as you mentioned, the, the, the sophistication of these, of these people in general. I mean, basically, the Netherlands, the sophistication of building this country out of nothing. I mean, it's basically flat pyramids. I call this, just think of the pyramids flat. I mean, this is a very difficult country to build. And yet they did it back without modern machines. They did it mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. their brains and their brawn, and they did it in persistence and organization. These are extraordinary. They're, they're 
not normal. They're like Japanese, right? <laughs> they're like people, yeah, but yeah. more so, right? And, and yeah, likewise, right. Well, they're even taller, right? They're like how I think the Dutch are the tallest people in the world, and so I always feel like a yeah. shrimp when I go there, and and metaphysically as well, because it is such a remarkable country. They are tall. I mean, they're bouncing their head off the moon. It seems like, and so, <laughs> so I mean, uh, but uh, I mean, extraordinary uh, people, and, and 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 thus came these extraordinary farmers, right? And so. And thus, they are an important target to take out uh, for people like WEF. When you're talking about information more, and when you're talking also the food supplies, I mean, this is just like when you, every, every uh, company, every, uh, you know, invading army or whatever always has a budget, right? There's only so much energy you have, and it's the same with WEF, the WEF. And so you need to concentrate your efforts to get things going in places like Russia and Ukraine and to get things going in Panama if they're behind that, uh, and also Netherlands. So, you know, pick your targets. You know, you're going to pick uh, vital uh, critical nodes, and Netherlands is a critical node. There's a lot of bang for the buck here by taking these farmers offline, uh, and, there's, and culturally as well. Uh, because, you know, once Netherlands is unmoored, remember, this, this, this is meant to be the hub of Tri-State City. Don't forget Tri-State City. I mean, this is... And what, you know, what is that Tri-State City? What's, what's the idea there? Tri-State City is meant to be a mega smart city between... Uh, the Tri-States would be uh, Germany, Belgium, and Netherlands, where those borders come together. This mega city that many Dutch have actually not heard of. And, uh, and, and they will take this farmer's land and make this mega city there and bring people from all over the world. And this is to, one of to, to what utopias. end, to what, to what end, to what end? What's, what's the uh, rationale well, for that? I central plan, central plan. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So what are the farmers, what are the farmers hoping to accomplish? Like in Canada, part of the reason that the truckers convoy ended, I would say, and I would say it ended pretty successfully in many, many ways. First of all, they had the sense to end it before it degenerated into anything even vaguely approximating violence, which was extremely wise and conservative on their part and careful and compassionate. Um, the opposite of all the things they were being accused of. And But part of the problem with the truckers' protest, it wasn't exactly obvious what the end goal was, you know. And so they were accused of fomenting rebellion and of wanting to produce a January 6th insurrection, which was basically what the bloody Trudeau liberals accused them of and tried to convince Canadians of, and which the Americans, even Democrats, think is an utterly preposterous notion and which was factually untrue to the nth degree. So, but they didn't exactly know what they wanted. They, they wanted the damn government to leave them alone fundamentally and stop mucking about with the energy economy and stop intervening in their life that made having a livelihood Im impossible. But it wasn't more concrete than that, you know, end the vaccine mandates, that was part of it, and the mask mandates. But, and so, but what is it that the Dutch truckers want apart from not being like eviscerated and chased off their land? Well, you know, the, I, I would say that the Canadian uh, truckers protest didn't end. It took on a life of its own. It spread. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, fair enough, at, man. Spread in America and here now, right? Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And what do the Dutch farmers want? Mostly they want to be left alone. They want to be farmers. Uh, you know, they, right. I was out, uh, out of the They want to go farm. back to work. They're farmers. I mean, they're busy. Yep. I mean, they're business yep. people. They're, 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 they're all of those things at once. They just want to be left alone. They want to be farmers. They have their own culture. And, uh, and they just want to do what farmers do, which is farm, right? And make money and graze their families and, 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 and live life, right? And feed other people, which is really nice of them, all things right. considered. Right. And I think everybody watching this probably has somebody in their family who's a farmer, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, pretty much all of us are in some way tied to farmers, if not directly, uh, very close indirectly. And, and the, the farmers, again, we can't understate this. The farmers are a backbone of this culture. And when it comes to information wars, whether that be Mao unmooring Chinese or the, the Russians doing this, you know, creating the Soviet Union, you want to cut people from their boat anchors, cut them from their cultural anchors, and then you can, uh, then they're very easy targets for many things. For instance, uh, for instance, uh, genocide, for one. Uh, and, and another is uh, menticide, right? Rape of the Mind, uh, which is a great book, which was written in Netherlands, right? Rape of the Mind, 1956, one of the best books on uh, brainwashing I've ever read. 
uh, written right here, <laughs> you know, uh, because this has happened many times in the past. It's going to continue to happen in the future. And one of the most important vaccines that we can take is to study cult making and menticides and how these techniques are used against people. I've studied these things for years because when I was in special forces, people talked about if you want to fight communism, you have to study cults because communism is a cult, right? It's, it's got cult-like components that are very important. Uh, you know, I, so I studied cults for years. I infiltrated a cult at one point. Actually, it was a mm -hmm, cannibal mm -hmm. cult that I tracked down, oddly enough, and infiltrated them. That's an interesting topic. Oh, uh, my God, they, yes. Uh, uh, it was epic. But, I mean, but the point is, is cults are cults. And the only cults people won't see is the cult that they're in, right? People will never see, and that would include me. If I'm in a cult, I'm probably not going to see it, right? Uh, but everybody else can see it. Hey, that guy's in a cult, right? And so, you know, the, the cult making of WEF, the WEF, we can see clearly they've got this climate cult. Right? Yeah. You know, everybody's yeah. like, oh, we've got to do this. And, you know, we're willing to kill people in mass to do it, even though we have no idea about this. Well, well OK, <laughs> so, so let's talk. Well, let's talk about that again. You know, the reason I like Bjorn Lomberg, because there are some concerns on the environmental front, like there always are. We've overfished True. the oceans to a terrible degree, and it would be better if we polluted as the least possible. And there is some evidence that human contributions to global warming are a genuine thing. But I looked at the data as broadly as I possibly could on that front, and I concluded that Lomberg's group in Copenhagen had the most intelligent approach to assessing the problem and offering solutions. And basically what Lomberg did was take the IPCC climate report and accept its prognostications on the global warming front as accurate. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he believes that or that they are accurate, but he was willing to start there. And then he calculated with teams of economists, and I don't know how, else the, how the hell else you do it, what the detrimental consequences for global GDP would be as a consequence of the proposed climate change. And then he uh, projected out what our wealth increase would be by the end of 2100 at 3% or 4% a year growth, which is about what we've averaged for the last 30 or 40 years. And he calculated how less rich we would be as a consequence. So we'll be much richer than we are now, barring all the catastrophes that are man-made that we've been discussing, but we'll be slightly less rich than we would have been if there wouldn't be climate change. And then Lomberg lays out a number of things that we can do to ameliorate the consequences of climate change, but he goes farther than that. He said, look, climate change is not actually the only problem that we face. There's a whole plethora of global problems, which is part of the reason there's like 200 uh, UN sustainable development goals. And it isn't obvious that we should be dumping trillions of dollars into climate change amelioration when we have other problems to solve as well. So he had 10 teams of economists rank order the world's problems as outlined in no small part by the UN and say, look, if we were going to donate resources, if we we're going to devote resources to the amelioration of these serious problems, what are the most serious problems and where can we get the most bang for our buck? And then he averaged across economists uh, um, approximations of what the cost benefit would be in addressing these issues. And what he found was that most of the issues having to do with climate change amelioration don't even meet the top 20. They're not even included in the top 20 for the things that we should be concentrating on most. And I read B. Lomberg's work and I thought, well, I've never seen anyone do a more careful analysis of the entire situation than this. Does anybody have a counter argument? And the counter argument seems to be, if you're not a true believer in the apocalyptic climate nightmare, and if you don't think that no uh, measures, no matter how dramatic, are not even sufficient, then you're basically an agent of Satan. And I just don't regard that as a, a careful and nuanced argument. I think it's appalling and it's a reflection of the ignorance and Luciferian pretensions of the globalist utopians and their absolute inability of them of themselves to educate to become educated on this front. And so. Well, sorry for the rant, but Jesus, you know, this is serious business. And into now it. they're Keep going. <laughs> well, now they're trying to shut down the bloody farmers. It's like, what the hell's going on here? We actually need food, especially poor, poor, starving people. Remember them? Socialists, aren't those the people that you're supposed to be on the side of? Well, all you're doing with your idiot utopian globalism and your environmental apocalypse 
and your willingness to identify yourself as part of the moral elite because you care about the planet is dooming, well, Michael thinks, a billion people to starvation. So what the hell? How is that moral? Well, you know, the climate problem is so serious that if we have to starve a few people to solve it, it's like, fair enough, man. Let's say you're right. Well, you're not, because as soon as you make people poor, you make the environment worse. Period. The end. Not just a little bit worse. Way worse. Radically worse. Just wait till you see what happens to Sri Lanka on the, on the sustainable biological front. So... Okay, back to the Dutch farmers. So what's going to happen in Holland and what's going to happen in Europe? You said it's dependent on whether the bloody Russians keep the taps off. What's going to happen? I think about that approximately once an hour. <laughs> uh, because uh, what's going to happen? This is, you know, the, the system is emerging. The energy is, the LNG is now cut off. So a lot of these things that are important right now might seem unimportant just one month from now if that energy is not turned back on again. Because this is going to cause um, an immediate cascade, right? And yeah. this summer will be over. Yesterday, you know, it was so hot here. Some places closed. It was only like 99 degrees. Of course, I just came in from Mexico, so I'm good to go. <laughs> I sweat, but I'm, you know, I'm from Florida, right? So, I mean, and, and so but they actually were closing some places here because it was too hot. <laughs> and, uh, and some public transportation. And it made me think, you know, this is actually kind of a minor challenge. This winter is going to be cold. Uh, this is a very serious deal. Uh, as you know, uh, energy is a, is a kill shot for food, right? I mean, if there's yeah, not enough yeah, energy, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not going to be able to create the fertilizer and transport the fertilizers that are needed. We already saw a large fertilizer plant closed down in Norway and others as well. That's just one of others. Uh, well, and, and, you, and, and Ukraine and Russia are major sources of fertilizer production. Yes. And China has just stopped their exports as well. And, and many others. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a cascade. And we're already, it's almost like a Kessler syndrome cascade here, right? I mean, it, it's just, uh, it, and, and at this point, uh, I think there's too much inertia to stop it at this point. Uh, there was, I think we could have headed it off even a year ago uh, if we suddenly had serious leadership uh, across and, and we directly addressed WEF if we had a president and a No, and a what we have... What we have is leadership who meet and then laugh about Putin's shirtless photos. That's what yeah, we have exactly. instead of serious leadership. Yeah, we have we have a pack of many issues. Uh, the the inertia is too heavy at this point. We're gonna we're going to see uh, a lot of starvation and a lot of hop human osmotic pressure. The migration. Yeah, uh, and, and of course this leads to pandemic. We'll have real pandemics because again, when you have many people starving, there uh, first of all they start migrating and eating things they don't normally eat. And their immune systems are depressed. Anyway, bottom line is, every time you get big famines, you get big pandemics, which will create more war. We get that positive feedback loop. Well, good. Then we can lock everybody. Then we can lock everybody down again, eh? That would be real fun. We can lock everybody down again, like they did in Shanghai. And then we can disrupt the supply chains any, every, even more. And then we can starve a bunch more people. And maybe we will settle out with 600 million people and have a sustainable planet, you know. With all those 600 million people living in the ashes and the skeletons and with bareness and apocalyptic nightmare everywhere around them, that'll be a hell of an outcome. It's interesting because, you know, some people say, hey, that's apocalyptic, apocalyptic and doom and gloom. And I say, oh, if you've looked at my work over the many years, you'll see I'm actually very measured. I wouldn't say something like this because I, 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 I know that my... Many people depend on me to get things right, so I research seven days a week, travel the world, talking with the right people, reading so many books you wouldn't believe, and, and I try to figure out what's going on, which is difficult. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I do have a good track record, and I can see how the conditions are setting. It's not about sparks. We see Panama, for instance, going in the wrong direction at this point, uh, and that's obviously vital, Panama Canal. Uh, we see uh, you know uh, issues between... Uh, Iran and uh, Israel, which could cause other energy issues. Nord Stream is cut. We've had the explosions in Texas and, and uh, in Oklahoma. Energy's gone. Even if Nord Stream were wide open, uh, Europe's got problem with energy this winter. That's just a fact of life, which means next year, remember, famine creates famine. Next year, we're not going to have enough fertilizer, period. We're eating 
the food that's already been grown at this point. So right now, uh, yeah. Jesus. And so and we, in, in addition to this, normally we have a lot more resilience. For instance, yeah. the droughts that we have in the United States, okay, we, have ter- we do have incredibly terrible droughts right now in the United States. Normally, we could kind of fill in the gaps, and it's not going to be happy days, but we'll fill it out. Nobody's going to starve to death. Uh, but now our resilience is reduced. And so what, you know, we're not going to be able to be sending food out to all over Africa and these sorts of places without starving our own people. Now, keep in mind, by the way, during famines, often countries like China were exporting huge amounts of food while their own people were starving. Mao was doing that. Actually, Stalin did that when, uh, when Ukraine was starving. It, that's, a, that's a strange thing about famine. Some countries continue to export food while their people starve. Uh, but that's a, a side topic. Well, that is what you do when you're aiming at starvation. Yeah, well, so you're a lot of fun to talk to. Jesus, you're the... You're I'm the, sure I made you I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, that's an even more dismal conversation than the one I would have with myself. I would say, well, look, Michael, thank you very much for talking to me today and enlightening me and all of the people who are watching and listening about these preposterous and appalling occurrences. I sure hope you're deluded and wrong, but thank I'm you. afraid you're probably not. Um, And that's really sad and horrifying. And we're going to be lucky if we get through this winter without major bloody catastrophe, as far as I can tell, on about five different fronts. And these absolute abdication of leadership in the West, especially on the environmental front, is right at the forefront of all of this. And so, all right, for everyone who's listening, I'm going to continue to talk to Michael behind the scenes, so to speak, at Daily Wire Plus. I've added that to my YouTube offering or my online social media offering, let's say, as part of this Daily Wire deal. I have been talking to all my guests for an additional half an hour or so about the development of their career. Michael's had an amazing life, I would say, in in about five different dimensions. And I, I would like to ask him how his interests unfolded and what pathway he followed and what his calling is, to use a, an a, anachronistic biblical term. And That's all offered at Daily Wire Plus, who have been kind enough to produce and film and edit and help distribute and publicize all of this work. Uh, That's also part of the Daily Wire Plus deal, which I think is a good thing for everyone, including me and hopefully the audience. And so we're going to switch over to the Daily Wire Plus. And if you want to support the work they're doing, which is at least in part trying to bring actual journalism back into the world so that people know that famine is coming, for example, um, please Give some consideration to offering them some support. You know, uh, we're hoping to make the Daily Wire Plus into a, uh, a reliable alternative news source, which means an actual news source in today's world. And, um, you know, I don't know if we can manage it, but that is our aim. So, Michael, thank you very much for talking to me today. That was uh, extremely interesting in the most horrible possible way. And uh, kudos on your adventurous spirit man and your courage in the face of all this god you have a a ridiculous life um it must be quite something to be trying to address these concerns conceptually and in the practical way that you're doing it traveling and so forth and by by keeping your ear to the ground it's an amazing thing that you're doing and so hopefully hopefully it's going to tilt us away from the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they certainly seem to be on the march again and that's pretty bloody sad to say the least so over and out, everybody. And Michael, uh, as I said, man, thanks very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Thank you, Jordan. It has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.